Today is the 23rd of May, 2014. We are doing an interview with Reverend Paul Nakamura at Manzanar National Historic Site. The interviewer is Elisa Lynch. Videographer is Mark Hatchman. Note taker is John Kepford. And Paul's wife, Kiku Nakamura, is also here uh, and will be interviewed later. So Paul, before we start the interview, I'd like to confirm that we have your permission to record it and to use the information that you share. Yes, you do. Let me start by asking when and where you were born. I was born in a little sugar town or plantation town of Waialua, Oahu, in Hawaii. It's a, it's a little town, but where we live was a, a tiny, tiny village, few houses only. And what is your full name at birth? At birth, it was Takeichi Nakamura. The name Paul was added while I was in the Army. And what are your parents' names? My dad's name is Teikichi, T-E-I-K-I-C-H-I. He was born in Iwakuni, Japan, in Yamaguchi, Ken. And my mother's name is Kazu, K-A-Z-U, Kishimoto. K-I-S-H-I-M-O-T-O. -O. She also was born in uh, the same area of I Iwakuni in uh, Yamaguchi, Ken, in Japan. Do you know about what year they, they came to Hawaii? Did they come together or separately? I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if she, they were married in Japan or they were married in Hawaii. You know, they, I'm not, I'm ignorant on that. I'm really not sure about it. Do you know what their family's uh, trades were back in Japan? I've met part of them. At that time, was it, it was after the World War II, and I was in the occupation army in Japan. So I went to visit my uh, mother's side, and uh, I'm not sure what they were doing, uh, but I'm sure it was in the farm. Every morning he'd go out and catch some fish so we'll have something to eat. And um, more than that, I really don't know. When they came to uh, Hawaii, did, what, where did they work there? From what I understand, my dad worked for a plantation called Waipahu, and I'm not sure what he did there. Then later on, they moved over to Waialua, and according to my mother, he worked as a, uh, she called it engineer, but it, it was in charge of a fuel pump for the cane fields, and uh, that's what he did. Then later on, he went independent, and he opened a, a tiny store, a very tiny store just for bread and some necessities, and he opened also a, a tiny fish market. So he peddled fish while my mother took care of the store. And we lived in the back side of the store. This was one, one house. And that was also in Waialua? It was in Waialua. And then when the war started in December 7, all the plantation fields along the coast were shut down and they built farms. This is for defense in case there was an invasion, you know, a sugar cane wouldn't, sugar cane field wouldn't be very good. So my dad had some land and he went into farming. The fishermen were not allowed to go out as they formerly did, though some of them did go out to buy, to get some fish, but the fish peddling was, had to be cut down. So that's why they went into farming. Okay. 
and my brothers also, some of them went into farming. But all together in our family, there were six of us out of eight boys saw military service. Five of them during the war. And I was the youngest, so I went in with the occupation army. So I'm definitely going to ask you more about you know, Pearl Harbor and your life after the war. Just before that, I'd like to fill in a little bit more about your childhood and also your family. If you could, uh, you said you were the youngest. If you could just tell us who your brothers and sisters are or were. Well, being the youngest, I always say I'm the oldest from the bottom. But uh, all my brothers were very uh, active, they were ambitious people because my dad always saw to it that he tried to help each one be established in some kind of a business that they, they wanted or whatever profession they wanted to be. And he sent my oldest brother to Japan and go to a university, University of Waseda. Then he returned home before the war started and was part of the original 100 Infantry Battalion. But he had to be discharged just before they went overseas, although he took his training in, in the States also. My second brother, Matsuo, also was sent to Japan to learn uh, cooking. And uh, he came home, and he also saw military service and worked as an interpreter, I believe, in somewhat, uh, some instruction at, at the language school in uh, Minnesota, I believe it was. Then my third brother was married. And he was he became a carpenter and built some things for the home. But he went in also on into farming when the war started. My fourth brother, Charles, um, went was very interested in, in social work. He helped with the YMCA. I was part of his YMCA group, and uh, he loved swimming and sports. He was a wonderful uh, sportsman, football, bicycle racing on, on, on 4th of July. He always win. He always won his uh, swimming also. He was very good. He coached. He had a local team. He trained the boys. Then. In 1941, he went to Redlands University in Redlands, California. It's a Baptist school, I believe. And there, he was the coach for the local high school in swimming and assistant coach for the university swimming team. But when the war started, he was sent to camp in Poston. Arizona. And from there he volunteered to go to Europe with the 442 in the, uh, 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 with the artillery uh, section of the 442. But then he was a radio man for some officers. And when an explosion, a bomb or something fell close by, he got injured and was sent to England for recuperation. So then he came out of the army. But while he was in Mississippi, he married his uh, wife, whom he met in Poston, Sumako Okamoto, O-K-A-M-O-T-O, -O, Sumako, S-U-M-A-K-O. And uh, so, while he was in the hospital, he wrote letters. He wrote to me. And he wrote saying that he doesn't know who I was. 
because he had amnesia from the shell shock, I guess they call it. And uh, But he had my address, so he wrote to me, and then, and then he spoke about a woman that wrote to him also that he had a child, and that was his wife. He wasn't, he wasn't sure who he, she was at that time, but uh, that's how it was with him. And uh, later on, he became, he became well and came to Los Angeles and went to school and learned uh, some trade on uh, electronics, radio, I believe it was. Then he went back to Hawaii and started to work for the plantation again, which he was doing also. He stayed with the plantation for a long time, and he's still there today. He and I are the only ones surviving. Then my next brother, well, he's he'll be 95 this year. My next brother was uh, Ichiro. Ichiro worked for the university's experiment station close to Wailua. Then for later on moved to uh, Honolulu to the university campus and, and worked for, for, for the agricultural department for a long time. He had a very fine position as uh, some kind of uh, field supervisor, I believe. And he, then my next brother, Masao, he stayed home. He loved music. He played in a school band, as did my brother Charlie. They both played trumpets for the school band. F he, w he, he was in the Army and served as interpreter in the Pacific uh, Theater. Came home, went to school, the butcher school in, in, in the Midwest, Ohio, I believe it was. And had and worked in Honolulu in Waiowa. And he took care of the family. He was the one that was not married. He stayed single, remained single all along. And took care of my mother and my dad and my sister who was handicapped since she was a child. She became ill, seriously ill. And so she, uh, he took care of them. Then my brother right above me, Masuo, M-A-S-U-O, went into fish peddling and did very well in Wahewa. He bought a home and married a fine girl, but she died early. But uh, he did well. And, but in the army, strangely enough, how the Lord works, he was ill. He became sick, and I visited him was at, while I was at Presidio Monterey and uh, visited him at the hospital at the uh, at, at, uh, San Francisco, the Army Hospital near San Francisco, Golden Gate, San Francisco. But it was him. One day, while I had basic training in Waiowa, I saw him, and I had just taken the test to go to uh, uh, the language school. But I haven't been keeping up with my language, so I flunked the test. So when I saw him, I told him what had happened. He said, do you want to go? I said, yeah. He said, go back tonight and tell them you want to go. So I went back that, went back and told them I want to go. There's no point you asking me to, to read because I got it memorized. <laughs> I got the first time partly memorized anyway. So he said, okay, you can go. So that's how I got into language school. So I thank my brother for that. But all my brothers, all my brothers have been supportive of me whatever I did. And so when I went to college after serving in Japan and Okinawa and came out of college at 
Gustavus Adolphus in Minnesota, St. Peter, Minnesota, in 1951. I thought I'll be home for about a year to earn some money so I can go back to school, to the seminary. And I was with my dad in the, in the farm. He talked to me, and he knew I wanted to go back. And that's when he told me, why don't you go to school? He'll get the money for me because he had done for every son to get something to get them started. And I'd like to do this for you. And I'm not sure where he got the money from. Because I know he didn't have the money. So some one of my brothers, or maybe more than one, he must he must have tapped them for it. Came to me say, Okay, you can go I got the money for the airplane. So that's how I got to go to school. And uh, so while I was in school in the seminary, the family always sent me a hundred dollars at uh, Christmas time. And uh, so I, that's how I survived with the GI Bill for it ran out uh, on my first semester in the seminary. And, uh, but it was a wonderful experience, and that's how I came to be where I am, thanks to my parents, my brothers, my sister. So I call them my heroes, family of heroes. And, uh, so that's, and I met my wife, of course, in Los Angeles. I'm definitely going to ask you about that. Oh, what is your, I don't, <laughs> Maybe I'm you can't tell. <laughs> what, what is your sister's name? Her name is Reiko, R-E-I-K-O. And she, she died a few years ago. She was, I don't know how old she was. She lived well, pretty long. In the, in the 60s, I think she was. And, uh, but she was ill all her life. She had surgery after surgery. And, um, and she... She was, um, I have to, I'm, I'm not sure what grade I would put her at, her, 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 her maturity. Perhaps it really wasn't very, very much, you know. And it was very difficult for her and for the family. And my mom had pledged that she would not eat chicken until she got well. So she never ate chicken for almost all her time with, you know, my sister. And you said that was from an illness in childhood? Child, well, she was still a child, and we were sleeping, we were in bed, too. you know, we slept on the floor, a whole bunch of us. <laughs> and uh, the folks were eating. Then I noticed she was in, in her, her mouth was twitching. So I went to tell the folks about it. They came in and, and somehow, from there on, it was uh, they called the hospital and all that. And, and that from then on, did something had. Uh, I, I'm not sure what it was. About how old was she at the time? Oh, I don't know. It was the kindergarten age. I would believe it was. You know, and uh, so it was very hard on the folks. But the family stuck stuck together, and they were very supportive of, of her all along. And, uh, so there are, you said, five boys and one girl? No. There Six was boys. Eight boys. Eight boys, okay. I'm, I'm the oldest, number eight. <laughs> <laughs> what is your oldest brother's name? Aso, A-E-I-S-O. Actually, there were two more that died in uh, either childbirth or right after birth. And yeah. your second yeah. brother, if you could just give us the names, because I didn't get all of them. Oh, my oldest brother's name is Aso, E-I-S-O. Second brother is Matsuo, M-A-T-S-U-O. Third brother is uh, Susumu, S-U-S-U-M-U. -S -S -U. He picked up an English name by 
the name of Norman, N-O-R-M-A-N. He was a carpenter. Then my fourth brother was Charlie. His name is Michito, M-I-C-H-I-T-O. Then the fifth brother is Ichiro, I-S-I-C-H-I-R-O. After Ichiro comes Masao, M-A-S-A-O. After Masao comes Masuo, M-A-S-U-O. <laughs> so one letter, that's it. Then came me, then they had to give me a long name, Takeichi, T-A-K-E-I-C-H-I. It's almost similar to my dad's one. And what was your sister's See, name? My sister's name is Reiko, oh, R-E-I-K-O. So when you were a, a child, um, what are some of your earliest childhood memories? Oh, being the youngest, I was left alone. I had lots of fun. I played along quite a bit. But one thing, I never got into trouble. I want you to know that. <laughs> I think I never did anyway. And uh, But... Uh, We did some chores around the house, you know. I had to feed the chicken. We had chickens in the back and uh, did little things. And we had a, this little store and I opened the store in the morning. And, you know, it was just the door was just a bunch of boards put to, you know, separately. We put the boards up every. It, morning and at night we every night we put it on in the morning we take it down then I slept where the porch so I swept the porch and had a little yard in the front for the cars to come and park so just kept it clean you know did little things then I also our family the boys uh, I'm not sure from who how it got started how many of them did it, but uh, we delivered uh, the, some newspapers, uh, Japanese uh, daily papers. They had two daily papers, the, the Nippu Jiji and the Hawaii Hochi, H-O-C-H-I, Nippu Jiji, N-I-P-P-U, J-I-J-I. But we had a small community, only had about six papers, that's it. So after language school, you know, we also went language school after our English school for one hour each day. After that, I would go to the post office and wait for them to bring the newspapers. Then I pick up my share. Then I just deliver them on the way home. And uh, so that's what I did for quite for a few years. What, but my brothers also did that. And as they all outgrew it, we just took took over. And uh, so that's what we did. During the summer, of course, we went swimming. There were, we were a small village, a very tiny, tiny place. Just a few stores, business stores. And uh, we were between two rivers. We were very original, you know. One river had a short bridge. So guess what we call it? Short bridge. <laughs> One was a long bridge. Guess what we call that? Long bridge. And uh, long bridge was, short, was closer to us than the short bridge. And beyond that was on one side was the plantation with its mill and plantation store and the high school and junior high school together. On the other side was the elementary school. And we had a store right in between. So you know, in those days we walked to school. People from, the, from both communities, the kids, the children walked past our place and they had to return home. To, the Japanese school was on the, the plantation side because there are some on the, another school on the left side for the people on the other side.
But one side was more for business. One side were plantation people. So what we did was, you know, we had lots of opportunities to go fishing, crabbing, and um, we had places w close by where the banana field, sugar cane field, and um, mango trees, papaya trees. Further on, we had a, a community of uh, truck farming people where we bought our vegetables. I, my mom would say, would you go and get buy, buy some onions, green onions? So I just go buy green onions or watercress. And we bought whatever things that they had, had taro patches. It was a lovely place to grow up in, lovely place. When I think about it, it was very ideal for a young person to grow up in. And uh, people were very friendly. You know, we just go into each other's place and enjoy each other. And then we had different people, Hawaiian people in the front, Chinese people in the front, Filipino, Filipinos on the left side. We're all around. We had a good time. and. Uh, so my upbringing, I, I believe, was truly a, a wonderful and very blessed uh, time. The church churches were. My first experience in in a Christian church was, I believe, was a young young. I still remember being in a Filipino church as a child. I was under a table. I don't know what I was doing under the table. And I may have been a rascal kid, I don't know. But um, then uh, my Chinese friend took me to an Episcopal Sunday school in Haleiwa, which was on the left side, the business people side. Then my brother, older brother, Masuo, in fact, he had an English name, I think. He called himself James, I think, but he never used it, hardly. But anyway, he uh, he uh, took me to the Japanese Congregational Church while I was in fourth grade. Since that time, I've been in church every Sunday. And uh, But I had fond members in the Episcopal Church, and uh, we, we, we went to the home of a deaconess, made some cookies, as, and we took it to the theater when they were showing the crusades. <laughs> so we saw cookies. So I had good memories. Church has been always a time of uh, wonderful memories. Always had a wonderful time in church. I just practically grew up in it. And, uh, I was baptized one day on a weekday, on a Tuesday night. I, I still think it was a Tuesday night. I went to a meeting and then called for baptism. So okay. So I went up and got baptized. Didn't have any formal instructions or anything, but I've been on the church all along. And so that's when I was baptized as a young man. I don't know how old I was, but uh, must have been a teenager. But uh, it was good. I really enjoyed it and became a youth leader, advisor to the youth and whatnot. And one year we went to the island of Kauai. The pastor we called after the war used to be on Kauai. And he helped many of the uh, people from Japan because he spoke Japanese well. He helped them with the, I guess, passport and immigration things. So when the war started, the FBI pulled him in just for that, that contact. So he was sent to Gila in Arizona. And we called him from there. And then the uh, people from Kauai loved him so much they said to come over and 
to visit them. And he didn't want to go by himself. So he got about few of our young, young people, about four, five of us, I believe it was, to go and help him with so in a deputation team. And I became the kind of the master of ceremonies. And I had to read one of the lessons in Japanese. Oh, I tell you, I worked on that Japanese. <laughs> And I wasn't good at it, but you know, just to read, so I'd, you know, I had to practice that fact section in Romans, where, you know, for we have this treasure in, you no, know, but who can separate us from the Lord Christ? You know, neither death, no suffering, nor anything can separate us. So, that that section I read in Japanese. And we had a wonderful time on Kauai. We, they taped us for radio. And when we came on on Sunday, we could listen to ourselves. <laughs> it was a good experience. And from there on, I decided to become a minister. And what was the name of that minister that? Reverend Osumi, Paul Osumi. And uh, he gave me a book called Don't List Paul. And then when I got into the army, I read it and got into the went into the army, in, and I noticed taking basic training. We had a sergeant from uh, New York. He had the most difficult time with our Japanese names. So when I went to um, Monterey, the language school, I decided I better have an English name, because they're going to slaughter my name out there. <laughs> Takeichi, what's that? And American going to call me Tak. I said, oh, no, I think I better get me uh, an English name. And so one of my other friends and I, we decided we'll add a name. So he added his name, Larry Matsuura. His name was Matsuura. And uh, so I was, what? Can I use? I said, well, just use Paul. I just read that book somehow. <laughs> it stuck on me. And, and I thought, well, that'd be a good thing to do. So I just used Paul. And the army changed it for us for free. You know. What was the faith of your parents? They were Buddhists, but very supportive, very supportive. They, they you know. While I was on the farm, I read in the paper saying that if we volunteer by a certain time, we can still qualify for the GI Bill. I said, oh, this is my turn. All my brothers were coming back from the war, so I wasn't needed on the farm anymore. So I well, approached my, my mom and said, I'm going to join the Army, and I'm going to go to the seminary. And she didn't say anything, but I'm sure she approved of it. And uh, then my dad, like I said earlier, made sure I went to the seminary. He said, if you go now, you come out one year earlier. <laughs> How can you argue with that kind of argument? So I went. So they were very supportive. I really treasure their their support and their love. The whole family has been very loving and uh, very supportive. In what ways are you like your father and in what ways are you like your mother? You'll have to ask my wife about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask her next. <laughs> well, I think my, my dad was very quiet. I hardly, really, I hardly spoke to him because he it's well, it's all English. I mean, all Japanese. And um, his 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 communication was what he did, and how he did things was. You know, when I need a haircut, he'll give me the bowl cut. <laughs> you know, or the, the, the little butch cut. You know, bowl cut was for women, for the girls. But I mean, for 
for the men, for us, for me, you know, he used to give me that as a kid. And uh, then I went with him one one time to Honolulu. He went very early to buy some fish. So I went with him early in the morning. Whenever we needed anything, he was there. And for our father and son thing at for the YMCA, he came out for that. He came out to see me playing basketball. I was on a high school basketball team. He came out to see me play, you know. So he was always there, although he never said anything. But he was always there. And uh, so that's how it was, you know. And so, so, so did my mom, but I know my mom was very supportive of me. I know when one, one, once I came home from Japanese school late, on, you know, I came all tired, and I went, all just came into the back door, in the back, and I just lay down on, on the floor, because <laughs> I was so tired. And without saying anything, she had made a little rice ball and just gave it to me. Without saying a thing, she saw how I was and just to encourage me. And then, you know, then she had asked me to do some help with the cooking, to grind some seeds that she needed for some part of her cooking thing. So I'd grind that and I'd help with the dishes and whatnot. So uh, they were always there for me. So I'm like my dad in a way, quiet, never like to argue much, you know. I never heard him argue and never heard him school anybody. And he just went about his work, but we all knew what where he was and what he did. He worked hard in, in his fish peddling, worked hard on the farm. It's I really I'm amazed at how 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 adaptable they were. He was in he could fix the machines. You know, like like a, like the farmers what in the old time out in the out here in, in the states, the, you 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 get a man from the farm. They could do most anything. You know, they could fix a car, because nowadays it's hard. But in those days, it was mechanical, so they could fix things. You know, and they did, and so did my dad. And um, we're always working, always working, but never complaining. So I think I picked up a lot of that. And I know some of my members used to tell me, especially in the older church, they say, you never complain about anything. You don't say anything, you know. You have to sh show your feelings more. <laughs> but what for, you know? It doesn't do any good. And it uh, doesn't help to get angry at people. And. Uh, so we just work along quietly and do what you can to see that things get done. Everything is going along. I think that's what I picked up from him quite a bit. Patience and be alert to what's needed and just get to work. That's all. You know. And so with my mom, you know, just go about your work. She, I can see how she, she suffered long for her for her daughter and how much she really yearned that she would have been okay you know but um, so you you get to feel that and you get to know how you maybe you should do things and just go about doing it quit fussing around so much over like they say don't sweat over the small stuff you know Stick with the basic things, the real things, and uh, so that has come in very well in in the ministry. At least for me, I think so. Anyway, you said that uh, your parents sent your oldest brother to Waseda University. Were any of your other brothers also Kibe? Well, my second brother also was. In a sense, he was, but they weren't there that long just to go to school and come back, you know. 
few did, years. That's about it. Did you ever go to Japan before the war? No, no. Only after the war, thanks to the army. Then after the war, you know, church, we had a doctor and Mrs. Tani. He was a surgeon in Japan. But he was also an ordained Lutheran minister. And he wanted to start some work with us independently. But it was too difficult. But he was very kind in and said, when he went back to Japan, he said, come over. So he paid all my way. Even while I was in Japan, he paid my way around. And he, he had someone to take me around the place. So I, I traveled all the way from Tokyo to, to um, Kyushu, where we had lots of Lutheran work in Kyushu. And then later on, we went to Taiwan. He went along with us with some other people to Taiwan. And all that with his graciousness. And uh, that's, that was the first time. No, the second time, second time, that's right. First time was with the army, the occupation army. So those are the only two times I've been to Japan. Did your parents ever go back to Japan? My mom did, to, to take my, 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 my sister to see doctors over there somehow. Somehow, I, do, I guess she must have heard of some, there's some doctors that probably could help her, so you know, she went there too. And, uh, but I don't think they could have done much. You know, so. so that, I don't know, I, I don't know if she went more than once or what. But uh, my, I don't think my dad ever went back. Not to my knowledge anyway. When you've talked about the plantation, was that a single plantation or a bunch of different plantations? And, and who owned one. it? Who owned the plantation? No, I really don't know who owned that plantation. It was called the Wailu Agricultural Company. And it's probably one of the big five, I don't know. Do you know what the working conditions were like? Oh, working condition was good on our plantation. I think so. I think so, but you know, I really don't know too much about the working condition except for when I worked. As a young man, we, you know, for employment, we worked in, during the summer. I worked on the plantation one summer. We worked uh, with hoe cutting grass, that's all we did. And uh, that, I think, was my first job, paid job, first paid job. The second page job was working in a pineapple field. That was my second job. It, the pineapple field paid better than the sugar plantation. Then my third one was with the defense at Schofield. And that paid even better. This is before the war? No, during the war. OK. Did you? ever leave your, your little town much when you were a child? No, the only time was when I went to Kauai. Then we would, well, once a, once a year, the school would take us on an excursion to downtown Honolulu to go to the museums, the zoo, and, you know, and go shopping at Crest. What was that like, oh, to go to the big great. city? Oh, it was great. You know, how it is getting into town and on the bus with your roommates and just go to the museum and academy of arts and then go to the zoo you know and here and there it was it was good but the best part was when you can go to the shopping in the store <laughs> where is why is it does that town still exist and if oh, not, yeah where, a, where is it it's on the north 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 end of oahu you go straight up from Honolulu, and you'll end up right there. Can't go any further. And uh, it's it's a big big plantation. It it's the second largest plantation on Oahu. 
next to I believe Waipahu was. I believe Waipahu was the largest. Then Wailua became second. And then you had several other places too, like Kahuku and Aea and Eva. Those were the big the plantations around there. And the, but Wailua was one of the larger ones. And we had, we had good management. Frank Mitkiff was our, our, what you call, manager, and he was a good man. And we had a good doctor at the plantation hospital which everybody could use. Dr. Davis was very kind and every year the seniors from the high school would go to Mrs. Davis and ask her for uh, some gardenia if she had whole plants of gardenia. So they would get the gardenia, it would in, in blossom and line it up in auditorium for graduation or whatever thing we're doing, you know. So they're very good, very good, good working people there. In fact, I, one year when our YMCA had a dance, we were selling tickets. And I, had, I was pretty gutsy, I think. I went to him, <laughs> to the manager, sell, sold him some tickets. <laughs> he bought some tickets. He said, I can't be there, but, you know, he bought some tickets for us. And, uh, but he was very, very kind. I know he'll drive along the way, and if he see an old lady walking, he'll stop, give him a ride. Or, and sometimes he would, when he sees an elderly person alongside, he would bow his head in respect. You know, you don't see that often. You don't see that often. And then when the war started, he wrote. It's a book on the, on these you know people who who who, who supported. He wrote to the government in support of the Japanese Americans in 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 Hawaii. You know how hardworking they were and how honest they were and all that, and that uh, they shouldn't be treated. You know, you know, in a mean way. And what was his so, name? Mitkiff, Frank Mitkiff, good good man. We had m many good people there in the plantation. And, uh, I think so, anyway. And how did the different groups get along, like the Hawaiians, the Filipinos, Chinese, we, we, Japanese? We got fine. We got along real fine. We never had, at least I, I don't, I never had problem with them. You know, I don't think anybody did. And, uh, so we got along fine in, in the community. And because, the, you know, when you have good management on the top, People can get along fine. I remember at Christmas time they, they used to have a huge Christmas program for the community, and we'll sing Christmas carols and they'll pass out some things, you know, Christmas candies, whatnot. So they do things for the people to, to get together, and uh, so I think they, they help the churches quite a bit too. So when you talked about the different churches that were there, were those mostly missionary churches or were they churches that the people themselves well, started? It, it, was, it was ministered by locals. And uh, they had, uh, they had uh, a, a program, I believe they had a program where wherever possible, they used locals to be the pastors, you know. That is why when I I applied for the seminary at at uh, Andover Newton in outside of Boston Newton Center in Boston, it's a Congregational Baptist seminary. I applied late. It was during the summer when I said, "Oh, you know," I, I applied, and they said, "Come over." And then when I did go over, someone told me, "You know, sir." If you're from Hawaii, you have a high priority because they want you to go back. And the missionaries to Hawaii came from that seminary. And uh, so that's why they have a very close tie with the Hawaii. And because at that time, it was full. The seminary was full with a waiting list, but they, they let me in. Because that's the kind of um, 
connection they have. The congregation of church that have very strong connections with Hawaii. Go to first missionaries were from that area. And, uh, so, you know, what it's, it's, one, it's one, one of the fine seminaries we have in, in, in our country, in the old, old seminary. Was there a Buddhist temple in your town? Oh, oh yeah. Every town had one. Every village had one, just about. In where I was, we had one Buddhist temple. And in Hale, we had two that I know of. And further on in Kawailo, they had one. Kawailo is where out in the outskirts. A beautiful place up on a hill. And um, But in Hawaii, where we are, wherever you go, it's nice. <laughs> it's quite way out in the boonies, you know, on sugar, cane fields, all over the place. So. Did your family follow the news from Japan or, or keep in touch with relatives in Japan? Yes, I think they did. I think they, they wrote letters and and you know, to the newspapers, they kept abreast of what was going on, you know. And uh, so they, 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 were, they kept in touch with the family members there. And during, during the war like that, you know, we used to send some care packages to them, and which m m many families did that, you know. And, uh, so that's the way it went. And you went to, you were in high school when the war started? I was in high school. I think I was in the ninth or tenth grade. It's 1941. I graduated in 1944. So 1941 would be about ninth, ninth grade, ninth or tenth grade, someplace tenth grade maybe. So what do you remember of December 7th, 1941? Well, first of all, My folks were on the way to Honolulu, but they were turned back. And they said, well, they were turned back. And that's when Pearl Harbor was being attacked. And so they, they described along the way was Schofield Barracks. They said people were all lined up along the road watching the planes come in. They didn't know it was a it was a war. They thought it was a maneuver. But then I guess later on, when when they saw, realized this is real stuff, then I think they, you know, got away. But uh, but they were turned back because of what was happening. But so that night, since I was a, I was in the Boy Scout. So I sat with my neighbor late at night listening to the radio. And we could see from where we are, way out there toward Honolulu, Pearl Harbor. I guess it was the ships burning, whatever. We could see the glow of, 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 the, of, of the lights late at night. You know, we, we just stayed in, in the radio late through the night, most of the night, just listening, you know. So, uh, that's that's how it went, and but martial law was in the, came into effect with blackouts, and while we were in school, they had dug a, right in the middle of the campus. They had dug a, a bomb shelter, and they issued a gas mask for each one of us. Everybody had to have a gas mask, and how to use the gas mask. We carried it with us all over the place, and. Um, so there were changes taking place, you know. But at night, we were careful to observe the blackout. Not one light has to show, not even a glimmer has to show through the windows. And so in that way, it was a little difficult, I'm sure, you know, especially for the older folks. And for the older folks, especially with the immigrants, it was a time for them to really worry. And we're not aware of, of, of we had any kind of uh, uh, relocation camps. It's only now I found out that there was quite a few, 17 sites, not camps itself, but sites where they had designated for 
I guess, to hold people for a while. But the most well-known one is on Sand Island. And uh, so uh, I think my wife will tell you more about her dad. But uh, in our family, you know, my dad was just a fish peddler. But, but any leaders or teachers, or language school teachers, the head of the house, the husband, the men were taken away. Do you have any idea how many men, are you talking a dozen men or a hundred men from your town? From our town? Oh, I don't know. I, just how ignorant I am about the, you know, they, they really kept it quiet. But I know one, one of my relatives, uh, he was a fisherman. But I understand he was taken in. And, uh, you know, I, I talked to his wife about it some time ago long time ago, really. And she couldn't figure out why he was taken in. He was just a fisherman, that's all. And uh, But he was taken in. And, uh, but other than that, I don't know of any others within my family and, or anybody else around besides the, the Buddhist priest. All Buddhist priests are automatically taken away. And uh, so the temples were closed, and uh, and so all all language schools closed down also. So, but the family remained, you know, the family remained, except that the the the, the, the priest itself themselves were taken away. But you know, we were really ignorant about what was really going on. Government did a good job of uh, keeping things quiet so that they won't stir up any problems I guess but and that people were sensitive to it you know the older older fellows were sensitive to it do you remember any anything that your your parents or your older brothers said at that time no we didn't do anything except we, we burned it we burned our books our language book that we we use for the you know Japanese schools well we had to burn all those Somehow we, you know, we all had bathhouses, and we 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 used to burn wood, fire, firewood, whatnot, to to heat up the the water. So that's where we burn all our stuff. And some people buried it, some some valuable, some hoping to recover it later on. But no, all we, all, all we had was books. You know, we didn't have any. Anything, uh, not that I know of. And I, so, in that way, and, and then coming home, and we had guards on the, on, 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 on the bridge all the time. So, you, I, know, I know one, one night I went to a young people's meeting in Haleiwa. This is just for Hawaiian congregational church there, the young people's meeting. So I used to go there now and then to, you know, it was a good fellowship, sing, sing a lot of songs, whatnot. And uh, I wasn't driving then. I mean, I didn't, not that night anyway. So I was walking home, and it, it, it's about, oh, I don't know, five miles or so, maybe more. And it was past curfew time. <laughs> I came on the bridge, and this jeep pulled up on me. It's, and uh, the captain, whoever in there, said, "Well, where were you? Where are you going?" I said, "Oh, I was at church, and I'm going home. Where do you live? Right across. I was near home already." Okay, get in the jeep. And they took me right to my home. They're very nice. <laughs> But th that's how it was, you know. They were nice, you know. They, they, they weren't there to, to do any harm or anything, just doing their thing. But uh, but I, I, there was some inconvenience in that way, you know. But, uh, f but being young at that time, we didn't feel it as much as the older folks did. So if, s okay, it looks like we're going to stop for a moment. I mean, it's an hour already. Okay. This is Elisa Lynch on May 23rd, 2014.
This is tape two of an interview with Reverend Paul Nakamura. And we were just talking about Hawaii during the wartime. And I was wondering if you could describe for someone who's not familiar with martial law, what that what it means to live under martial law, what the rules are, what it's like. Well, for far as I know, from my perspective, martial law is when the army takes over the place and will come under their uh, authority. Although there is still a civil government, but still the martial law is what controls the whole movement of the people. And in our, in our place, then they have guards all over the place, and we have blackouts, and there's some restrictions where you can go, where you cannot go. But as much as possible, you know, they, they, they try not to interfere with your, uh, with your civil life. But the war effort comes first. The defense of the place comes first. So that means you can only go certain places, and certain places you just have to stay out. And they'll, they'll let you know. They'll let you know. And, um, but it is all for the defense of the place and for the quick uh, deployment wherever they have to go. So at times you would see a convoy of trucks moving along and uh, or mi move military equipment or personnel going to place to place. And they have camps here and there where they normally wouldn't be. And uh, so that's, that's what it is. And you, you see military personnel, you know, uh, either on, on leave, walking around, coming into town. But in a small place where we were, it's such a small place. They just bypass us. But still, we are along the main highway, so we, we want to see some, you know, convoys were not going through, and the military people going through. But very few business with military people. But what we did also, we had some uh, pigs in the back. So we got our food for the pigs from the military. You know, somehow my, I don't know how my brother did it, but he went and was able to get, make an agreement with them. So we'll go to their place every, every, every day or certain time of the week and get, get all the leftovers to bring back and to take care of our pigs. And you know, they're good food. So pigs are always happy. <laughs> but uh, so that's part of the things that g that went on with us in, in in Hawaii during the war. But we never got into any problem with the military. At least we did not. And, and, uh, so th that's what it really is about. You know, the, the restrictions that there are, which they wouldn't be normally uh, to go place from, from one place to another. And uh, now and then you'll find them taking part with us. And uh, we had a basketball league. And there was one, I think these were military people that had a team to play in our local league. And of course, they were mainland people, so they were pretty big. <laughs> compared to us. <laughs> and the gym was a very small gym. But, and I, I'm not sure how they turned out because we had some good teams also. But uh, but it, it went along OK. More than maybe, I'm not sure how it went some other places, other communities. But in our, in our community, at least from where we were, directly where we were, it went along OK. Were there any sort of tensions after the war started between the people in your village, in your town, of between the Japanese, the Chinese, and the Filipinos because of what was happening no, in the war? Not, not with the local people. 
we never had problem with them. But the, the problem came a lot of often time with some of the of the uh, young men with with the military personnel. And this this uh, this I, I remember now, because the, sometimes the military personnel will uh, take out the local girls, and uh, this was resented by the, some of the young men, you know. And um, but other than that. I, I haven't seen any kind of attention, and uh, it's, it's more on that social level that they had some problems there. That that was my experience. That's it. But I cannot speak for the others because I'm not that familiar with it. But I kind of generally stuck to my routine, you know, working on the farm and at home and going to church and taking care of the young people and whatnot. So. Um, I was really not that much in the, the general uh, population where people, the young young people, were doing, except for my little segment of, 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 of you know of life there. So. At what point did you become aware of the scale of destruction from Pearl Harbor and Kaneohe and Schofield and all all of the things that happened there? Did, were you aware of that at the time? Not, not, not really that, that, that much because we're out, way out in, out in the country. Now, if you're in Honolulu, I, I think you'd feel it differently. They were close to, close by. I remember one of my, my friends who went to Mid Pacific Institute. That's a congregational high school. It's a boarding school where they have people from other islands come to go to school. It's a Christian school, very hi highly, highly respected school, out in, uh, in near the University of Hawaii. I understand that from what I was told that one of the things happened, whether it was that night, December 7, or succeeding nights, some of the, the boys, they surrounded the, uh, the, uh, the women's dormitory to make sure they were safe. So that, that's how they, they, they did things over there in, in Honolulu and, they, and how they protected each other. But in Wailo, we, I, I haven't heard anything of that sort. You know, We're pretty open. And, uh, we didn't have that kind of close community thing to, to protect one another. Because this is a dormitory after all. And, and no one really knew what was going on. So, And no one really knew if there was to be an invasion or anything. And uh, so they, they kind of were on alert all the time. But if invasion came, most likely they may come some other place. May, I don't know if it will ever come to where we were were too far from any, any place that was uh, of really significance, you know, except for landing maybe, I don't know. But but we had guards and we had people on the watch out there too. That Kaena Point was where they came in through. The planes came in through Kaena Point, which is from our side, to get to Pearl Harbor. And uh, so when you see the, in the movies, the plane coming in, they're coming in from that point. And you know, if you're in the movies, you see before the planes came in, some of the military men were listening. They, they heard of the, some planes coming in. You know, you, you have those two, two people on the lookout with the earphone and all that. And they, well, that's where they came in from. But that's kind of point where we were on our side of the island. And uh, so, so it, it would have been heavily guarded in that area. I would think so. I'm not sure. I never did go and find out. <laughs> did you remember seeing or hearing the planes yourself? No, I don't know because I was unaware what was going on. And uh, so none of us really knew what was going on. We were all surprised ourselves. And uh, but the uh, only time 
only thing that alerted us of anything was when my folks came back, when they said they would turn back, you know. And, uh, but other than that, we don't know. You said earlier that some of the older people were afraid. What, what were they afraid of? Well, being immigrants and uh, from Japan, and Japan attacking the place, and there were rumors before that. The, you know, we heard rumors before that. What if we were at war with Japan? You know, that kind of rumors were always going around. I, I never really thought much about it. And it to me, it was an impossible thing. And um, war was something far away in my mind for those things. But um, so the, they were more aware of it because of the situation of their planning. And they were not able to become citizens. They were not allowed to become citizens. They were not allowed to own land. They always bought land through the citizens.